take me for a run, run. Uh, none of that, man. Real. I'm tight, I'm gonna roll. Do that. I never rock about a day in my life. And what I do. See, I draw for a living. Work for mine. Talk for mine. You saying what you do, then. I'm gonna take no money. The video y'all been waiting for, and you can't wait to see what I have in store. Let's go. Back to those calls, just specifically, when you listen to Adrian Bean's phone um, jail recordings, did you hear him telling his wife about felonies that he had committed as a part of this incident on September 11, 2013? Yes. And let me ask, is it a felony to shoot someone? Absolutely. Um, is it a felony to possess a gun while you may be on probation? Objection, Your Honor. He's asking the witness to provide a legal conclusion. Yeah, it's not. I'm speak on the law. I stand question. Given what you heard on that jail calls, was Adrian being implicated himself in this armed robbery? Yes. Okay. A few additional questions about this interview. Again, prior to meeting with Adrian Bean, did you have any conversations with him about any of the other evidence you had gathered up until the point in which you met with Mr. Bean? Not at all. And was there information that Mr. Bean told you that was corroborated by the other evidence you had gathered up until this point in time? I would say so. Did you have any vendetta against Mr. Williams or the person known as Young Thug as a part of this case? Not at all. Outside of the video interview and the recorded portion all the way up until you dropped Mr. Bean off at the jail, did you have any further conversation with Adrian Bean about this case that was not recorded? Not at all. And did you ever tell Adrian Bean to make Young Thug or um, DK or Frederick Prothro to be a part of this case at all? No. During the course of um, your investigation and even afterwards, did you ever have the occasion to encounter Mr. Jeffrey Williams? Yes. Uh, where was it that you encountered Mr. Jeffrey Williams? So I worked an extra job off duty in uniform back in those days at Neiman Marcus up at Lenox Mall. Then I worked there for 13, like, I'm sorry, 11 and a half years. And is that where you saw Mr. Williams? Yeah, oddly enough, two, three weeks after I was pretty much figuring out what I had in this investigation, he just walked in. I sit on a stool in uniform. And I just, I reached out to him. And when you say you reached out to him, tell the jurors, what do you mean? So I'm on the stool, it was a Friday, because I only work Fridays in Neiman Marcus. I have a bunch of other extra jobs at the time. But I'm sitting on my stool, uh, working this case out, but I'm off duty. So I got no recorders, I'm in a police uniform, I'm just a cop. Jeffrey Williams walks in, I say, yo, honey, let me holler at you. Yeah, I mean, that's just how I talk. And at first he was hesitant, but he came right over. And I just told him what I was working on, and how his name came up. And I told him why I was telling him that. So let me kind of go back and talk about your extra job. You only work on Fridays. Why were you employed in the I'm, I'm working for the business. Uh, I can't work a high-end luxury jewelry store. I work the luxury jewels department in Neiman Marcus. And so I have to, you know, I have to present in uniform as a deterrent. Now, so that you encountered um, him. Let me ask you this. About how many times did you see Mr. Williams at Neiman Marcus? After, at or, after or during this investigation? It's a total of four times. Now, let's talk about this first encounter. So you're sitting on your stool and you saw him told him to come over here. Did he approach you? He came on over. Okay. And what, if anything, did you say to him when he approached you? I went right into it. I said, listen, I'm working in an investigation. Your man, Bean, I don't know whether he's your friend or not, but he put your name in that, that big explosion when the car went into the, went into the uh, laundromat up on Cleveland Avenue in O'Hayville. I said, he put you in the car. He says that you even had a gun. You were in the car and you got away. I said, you're going to find out about this later because you're going to get the discovery from other people in the car, which is all my reports and my audios and videos later, you'll have access to them if you have relationships with anybody in the car. I said, so I'm telling you on the front end, your name got put in this. And once you said that your name got put in this, uh, did Mr. Williams say anything to you? He denied any involvement, uh, being there, uh, anything illegal that happened on 9-11-2013 between Cleveland and Oasis. Okay, when well, he denied any involvement in that, he was not there. What did he do? So I told the young brother, I said, listen, I can arrest you based off what being said. That's just not how, that's not who I am. I can lock you up, and then before people locked up, we'll figure out what's up. I said, the way I get down, if I get DNA off that gun, being said was yours, and you're going to make me come hunt you down to eliminate you from this scientifically, or you're going to come in voluntarily, or do I get a warrant to come get you and get your sample? 
Because I can get a warrant and get a sample to go in your mouth if somebody says you were at a crime scene. That's enough. Um, and I left it like that. And I, and I also, I'm sorry, I also told him, I'll never arrest you based on what one joker says. I'm going to need something else to back it up. At that point, um, did the police say anything? He just continually denied it, but he was very respectful. And you talk about what he said. Did you notice know anything physical in the air? I think it was He was... He was unnerved. He was shook. You know, I've been around a lot of people. I've approached them in uniform. I've approached them in this uniform. And you can say certain things to people, and, you know, you can almost see their heart beating out of their shirt. That was one of those situations. And I was just shook. What does shook mean? I mean, you're nervous. You're, you're, you're uneasy. You, 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 you're hearing information you just didn't expect to hear. After he denied his involvement, um, did he leave the Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we clapped up, and he went on about his way. And was he by himself at that point? He was. They said there was enough, there were four encounters. Tell the jury about what your second encounter was. So the second encounter, um, this is 10 years ago. So it's about two to three weeks, could even be a month later. I had gotten word back from the scientists at the GBI that that firearm linked to being through testimony, I'm sorry, that firearm linked to Jeffrey Williams through the testimony only of being came back inconclusive with too many male contributors on that weapon to be uploaded into the CODIS database for identification. And you said you had that information. What happened on the second encounter? I told when he walked in the store, he was again alone. Let me holler at you again. That's pretty much what I said. He comes on over, and I just break the news to him. I said, you know what, man? I said, I'm not going to be able to do nothing with this for me. I mean, I could arrest you, but I'm not. And uh, this may sound crass, but what I said to him was, I did some research on you in these last three weeks to a month, and I found out you about ready to blow up. So I said, go make your million dollars and stay the fuck off Cleveland. That's the last thing I said to him that day. And you say it was worth it. Exactly. What happened once you said that? We clapped up, and he was gone. Your third encounter. Tell the truth about that third encounter. Well, this is going to be... Okay, right. Losing count. Um, so this may be a few months down the road. This time, Jeffrey Williams, he's accompanied by other individuals when he comes in the Neiman Market. I'm in a uniform. I'm on the stool in Precious Jewels. I step aside. Now he is saying, I want to holler at you. So he comes up with this, I'm going to call it entourage, it was some people. But in particular, there was a woman he identified as his sister. He called her by name Dolly, and he gave me a job offer. He said, I, I want you to be my travel security, because I'm getting ready to do my thing. His, do his uh, sister, I only know her as Dolly, she gave me her phone number. I said, I'm not interested. I said, don't live your life. But I did take her number. She gave it to me. I put it inside my city issue cell phone, where it's set for the next 10 years. I never even dialed that number. And as a part of this case, okay, you provide me with a screenshot of your phone log showing where you went and put it in her office. Yes, I did. Show you what's the market space is a 179C. Tell me if you recognize it as a 179C. This is the address book to my city issued cell phone. When I retired, I had it all downloaded uh, so I could access it as needed in retirement. And this is it. And is that a fair application of your uh, address log that was in your city cell phone uh, that you got when you left the department? Yes. Your Honor, this time I'm sticking with like the 1060 to 179C. Is that an objection? Um, Counsels? On behalf of Ms. Williams. Hi. Case 179, Charlie, is admitted, maybe published as you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. And still so old school? Let's keep it old school. <laughs> um, you can point to where you see uh, the name of Ms. Dolly Young. This is how I put it in that day right there, Nima Marcus Precious Jewels. Now, by any chance, did you have the date in which you um, inputted that? When you, did it have a date in which you, when you inputted that information to your phone? You know, it might have. I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't know about that technology. After um, you got her number and you put it in your phone, um, did you ever see Dolly again? I didn't know. Okay. And here the phone numbers aren't on here, but have we just extracted out the actual phone number? Yeah, the phone number is not up there, but it's over in the right somewhere. Okay. All right, thank you. And then there was a final encounter. If you could tell the jury about the final encounter. Well, the last encounter, I'm on a Friday at Precious Jewels in uniform, getting my cheese, working hard. I see Jeffrey Williams come into the store. We're about 25 feet from each other. He's going to the down escalator. He's in the company of Walter Murphy, who I know on site. Walter Murphy, in his right pocket, has a long knot. They call it the street, the kind of can't fold. And it's hanging out of his right pocket as they're going down the escalator, the two of them. Thug is pointing to the long knot. 
and making sure I see it. Don't know what it meant. I mean, I, I, I can have an opinion, but that was it. I waved at them, and they went downstairs, and I guess they, uh, they bought some items. When you say the long knots, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? Well, it's the money that can't fold. It's cash, U.S. currency, and so much that can't fold. Back in those days, I haven't seen it much lately. Jokers would just, like, have the money, you know, straight flossing the money out so everybody could see it. And during that interaction, did you have any verbal communication with either Mr. Murphy or Mr. Williams? I think I snickered, and they snickered, and they went on downstairs and made their purchases. I just want to follow up on something that you uh, said minutes ago um, about destroying evidence. <clears throat> I don't have the transcript, I just have my notes. Okay. My notes indicate that you said it's a problem if it is exculpatory evidence or evidence that could set someone free. Is that's that? That's what I said, yes. Okay, is that, that's accurate for what you said? Give or take, yeah. Okay. Um, and that would be illegal? I would say so. And that would also violate police protocol? If it was information that was going to set someone free, those are the key words. Tapes can, or written testimony, that's going to set someone free is important. That's why it has to be preserved. What about other statements or recordings that wouldn't necessarily set someone free? Would that still, would be destroying those recordings still be destroying evidence? I mean, I don't know because I, I don't have that. I've never had that situation. Uh, I know of detectives that will record things and then reduce it to writing when they get back and they don't use the recording. I've seen that. Me personally, I can speak for me. I turn over everything, but I'm not. Yeah, that's, that's not the hard and fast rule. But the hard and fast rule is any, any information is going to set a person free. You can't destroy it. What about a statement that's taken from a witness that you determine to be a lie? What, what, what is the appropriate thing to do in that circumstance? So what kind of statement? Are you talking about audio, written? Audio. Audio, I mean, that's open to the detective or whoever law enforcement official is holding that information. I can only speak for me, and it's my practice. I don't. So... Your testimony is, I understand you're speaking for you. That's all I can um, do. But as far as protocols and legality, you're not aware of any laws or protocols, APD, standard operating procedures, that would prevent the destruction of an audio statement if the detective determined it to be a lie. Me personally, I can only speak for me. I don't know the city policy word for word. <clears throat> David Quinn Jr., homicide detective, working 19 years in that field, I never destroy anything. Can't speak for the detectives. I don't know the rules. I don't know all the rules for APD. Okay. Um, you did take a statement, a recorded statement, uh, with your lapel recorder from uh, Mr. Nava Flores on 9-11-13, correct? I did. And in preparation of your testimony and from days ago and also today, yes, sir. Uh, you reviewed that recording, correct? I did. And you would, re you would agree that at 3 minutes and 36 seconds of this recording, or anywhere on the recording, there's reference to a first statement, and if Mr. Nava Flores wants to clear anything else up from the first statement he gave. I remember that well. Okay, and you would agree that there's, uh, that clearly establishes that there were, in fact, two statements given. Okay, only one given to me. I can't speak to whoever that law enforcement official was that Nava Flores spoke with. It was in the ether, and I'm, I didn't know who it was. And I'm going to get back to that, okay? So your testimony today is that you only took one statement from Mr. Nava Flores. Yes, and a second, a second written breakdown of all the encounters with Nava Flores, which was contained in my uh, supplementals. Okay, and, and you're the lead investigator in this case, correct? I'm the quarterback, yeah. Quarterback. Buck stops with you. That's right. I throw the ball, but I can't catch it. Okay. And um, in, in, you acknowledge the importance of police reports for memorializing facts that are learned at the time, correct? Yes, I also acknowledge that it's not an exact science either. And you also acknowledge that police reports are important when you're called to testify about things from 2013 and it's 2024. Absolutely. All right. Um, you wrote a three-page incident report regarding this case, correct? I don't remember how many pages. But you wrote an incident report? Okay. And then you also wrote a 47-page supplemental incident report outlining your investigation, correct? I did. Okay. This first statement that Mr. Nava Flores gave, I want to ask you as the quarterback, who did he give this statement to? I don't know. I mean, and I can go even further, is that there are a lot of players on the field. But what I heard from someone, some law enforcement, that it was going to be a reported stolen vehicle. 
which mucks up or throws a monkey wrench in my investigation. Who told you that information? That there was I don't I don't know. It was in the ether. This is in the fog of investigation. Lions, tigers, and bears on mine. That's what was going on out there. And it was something happening. It was something happening out there where it was going to be a reported stolen car with that crashed up car at 126 Cleveland. So I said, when I got up on the hill, I'm like, I needed nothing but truth. I don't care whatever he told. It was a litany of law enforcement out there. Okay. Again, the fog of the game. Okay, but the fog didn't make that statement, did it? I don't know who made it. Okay, it was a person. Exactly. And I'm asking you who that person was. I don't know. Okay, is it in your, in your 47 page report? Does it indicate to you who gave you that information? <laughs> Not at all. Basis. Sustained. Do you have a um, officers and detectives? You're not the only one with a recording device, are you? I don't know. There are people out there, but I don't know what they carry on or how they record information. Okay. Do you have a recording from this initial statement given by Mr. Nava Flores? I do not. Do you have an ATD? Yes, sir. Can I say this? Yes. I don't know if it was recorded or was it just a verbal statement. Because verbal statements are statements just like recorded statements. Technology has not changed facts. Or, or information. And as far as APD, they also have what's known as uh, written statement forms, correct? Where witnesses can write down a statement. They have that as well. But okay. you can write a statement on a paper plate. I mean, it doesn't it have to okay. be on anything well, in that, particular. All right. to, there's no ceremony to a statement. Do you have a paper plate with Mr. Navis <laughs> Flores' statement, original statement written on it? Not on this case, but in my career, working 19 years, somebody did write me a statement on a paper plate. That's all we had back in 2001, if you want a literal example. Well, I, I'm just focusing on this case. So you do not have a paper plate with Mr. Navis Flores' statement I written don't. on it? Uh, what about a written statement form used by APD? Do you have a written statement form with Mr. Nava Flores' original statement? I do not. Okay. Original statement? I do not. Okay. Court, uh, I'm going to change the subject. Courtney Bean, um, she's the wife of Adrian Bean, correct? That's correct. All right, and you were out there with, um, you were wearing a suit? Uh, 9 11 13? Yes. Okay, and you have that recorder in your lapel, correct? A very small bubblegum size recorder? <laughs> I don't chew bubblegum, but yes. What, what did you say it was the size of? A package of gum. Package of gum, thank you. Um, so you had that with you on that date, correct? I did. And you encountered Courtney Bean at 2233 Macon Drive that afternoon? I did. And you had a conversation with her, correct? That's correct. Did you record that conversation? Nope. Okay. Um, you also had a phone conversation the next day with Courtney Bean, correct? I did. Did you record that phone conversation? I did not. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Right, sir. The biggest question that I would have to Mr. a and &E Star, who's doing a so-called masterful rendition of acting, I have a simple question. You would let a man go that was in an officer involved shooting slash robbery who got away? The sense that makes y'all, y'all gotta help me out. Y'all gotta help me out. I, I just, to me, I don't get it, right? And then the interrogation video, we already had the audio, so I won't be going over it again because I feel like at this point in time, it's, it's pointless. But what I would say is this, right? I would ask this simplistic question. Do we understand that that was a hostage negotiation tactic that he did? You got kids? You admit you got kids? Let's bring the importance of your kids. You got a wife? Let's talk about the importance of your wife. He essentially got this man to admit that he's an accessory out his own mouth on camera. Oh, now, I don't rob. I don't do that. I don't do that. Who are you trying to convince? See, what I believe is this. I believe that Adrian Bean was already ready to tell when he got locked up. The robbery ain't go right. He felt how he felt. He did what he did and all that stuff and everything like that. And that's what he did. That's my personal belief. So it is what it is. But I have to ask this simple question too. Why would you tell Young Thug during an active investigation that, hey, bro, you know your homie Bean? He's spilling the beans over there. And uh, yeah, you're going to find out in discovery later if you're close with anybody in the case. Your third like, nigga, I don't know what you're talking about. I can, what the hell? But then I get it. 
was a scare tactic. So what I would ask if I'm Brian Steele is how often do you do these scare tactics? And they're going to object and say, Your Honor, that's mischaracterization and all that. Well, all right. How many times have you let a person go and an officer involved shooting that escaped with a felony robbery? Oh, this is just the only one. Okay. Also, let's add in the fact of how often is it that you allow individuals who are involved in the case to know who is, quote unquote, giving information on them? And is that a wise choice to do? Did you want Young Thug to react and possibly get this nigga killed? Is is that possible? Because it seems like this seems like to me what actually happened was Buddy tried to muddy it up a little bit. I wasn't involved in that. And then he said, I could go and get your mouth DNA swabbed and all that stuff and everything like that, but I'm not. You're a police officer. Why wouldn't you? Well, Brian still has to do, stop being buddy-buddy and paint this nigga as a dirty-ass cop, which it already is because he admitted it. He said he talked to Adrian Bean's wife without the recorder, but the recorder is everything. I don't chew gum, but you know what a stick of gum size is. What stupid shit is that? Listen, I don't drive Ferraris, but I know what the engine size on a Ferrari is. I definitely don't. I don't drive Ferraris. I ain't got that kind of money. I'm driving a 1999 Toyota Civic. I mean, Honda Civic. So, you know, hey, it is what it is. I ain't balling like y'all. But let's take it a step further. That man, Brian Shaw, came in with the exact questions that I wanted asked. I had a couple of more questions that I would have liked to ask, but he came in there, fire and brimstone, fire and brimstone. Because one thing that happened on that stand was when that man got flustered, he stopped looking at the people and he was trying to explain it to him and they had to and do the little quick little jabs. See, before he was looking over to the side and giving grand presentations and talking so eloquently and so controlled and all this stuff. But when Brian Shaw basically got on his helmet, he was like, uh, well, uh, uh, because when you break it down, your man, chapstick detective, yeah, him, him sitting up there and deleting that recording was illegal. And the fact that he lied on the stand and said that he didn't was illegal. Then the judge made sure not to put in that white piece of paper that it was a detective, some lady that isn't called. You would think that the way in which they're doing this, you got over 700 witnesses, that one of them would be one of the detectives who actually wrote a report on what actually happened. Because at the end of the day, the reason why this part is, why this particular part of the case is massively important, because what it does is it says that Young Thug told us to go get the money. Go rob these individuals and I'm going to oversee it. I am a gang leader, a gang boss, a gang gang everything. I orchestrated this. I told y'all who the mark was. I did my history. I did my research on it. And y'all go ahead and execute what I told y'all because I'm the leader. But it also kind of backfires a little bit because Pro Throw, well, not Pro Throw, but Bean isn't a gang member at all. At all. So you got that part. Pro Throw allegedly is a crip, but I don't know. I can't confirm or deny that and stuff like that. And I'm not going to put that jacket on them. So that's the thing is this is one of the things that they show as far as the Rico is that YSL uses guns, sells drugs, and rob people. Well, two out of three ain't bad on this part. But ultimately, I don't think that Quinn is as savvy as he thinks he is because at the end of the day, for somebody who did things quote unquote, by the book, you did two things that made no sense. You let a man know about an active snitch in a case, and then you said that you do things by the book, but you don't know all the rules, especially when it comes to procedures in which you're doing. That is like you guys right here being a goddamn amusement park operator, and you don't know all the ins and outs of the Ferris wheel. When you press that button, you know which button to press, you know which button to stop, and you don't know all the buttons. Yeah, I, I call bull. But, y'all see this video at 3K likes, do me a solid. Hit that button up. We got a longer video with this one, man. Um, if you want to, man, pinned in the comments. Check out the Diddy carousel going on. 
Did he do it? Did he not? I don't know. But uh, yeah, sure to keep your people aware. Subscribe, turn on the bell, stay notified. And I'll catch y'all in the comments. I'm not really going along crime like that, bro. So I'll be over at like Fox 5 or whatever the hell. Or no, no, no. Uh, 11 Alive because they have the higher audio. So yeah, we'll be at 11 Alive. I'm not really going to be over there at uh, Long Crime because they be doing some weirdo stuff. But like I said, I'll catch y'all in the next one.